Today, I'm really excited to talk to everyone about our unique single molecule method and how we use it to study DNA, plasmid kinetics, and structure. But before I dive into the details of this research, I think it's appropriate to first describe the technology and the technique our group pioneers. So first off with a problem statement, in single molecule fluorescence microscopy, molecules are very often moving quickly within a small field of view, naturally leading to short observation times, which is bad if you want to say anything about these molecules. You'll notice, however, that this is not the case for my title screen. These molecules are somehow confined within the focal plane. And so how do we do this? Well, to start off, my supervisor has developed a technique known as convex lens induced confinement microscopy or click microscopy for short. So here you can see an image of my supervisor's proprietary technology commercialized through her startup company, Scopesys. And to explain how it works, I'll just zoom in on the two most important components, the flow cell and the pusher lens. And so first we flow our molecules of interest into the flow cell. And then using the pusher lens, we compress the top cover slip into the bottom cover slip. And so if I zoom in further on the bottom cover slip, you'll see that the molecules will become confined within these nanoscopic features etched into the bottom of the flow cell. Uh, and because these features are just 500 nanometers in depth, this means that the molecules will be trapped within the focal plane of the microscope, and we're no longer limited by things like diffusion. Instead, we're only limited by things like uh, photo bleaching and such. And so just to note, the geometry of this bottom cover slip can actually be changed to fit a number of applications like nanochannels. Uh, you can have these ring patterns, but for the sake of this discussion, we'll focus in on these pits as they're predominantly used for the DNA binding kinetic assays. Okay, so what are we actually using this tool to study? Well, we want to study these supercoil induced structures in DNA plasmids. But what the heck is supercoiling? Well, this is just a fancy word to describe the over or underwinding of the DNA double helix. This is analogous to when you twist up an elastic band, as you might see in the demo in my video feed, if you can see, if not, just use your imagination. Um, the only difference between an elastic band and a DNA molecule is that the DNA is double stranded. And therefore, the torsional energy associated with the supercoiling can actually drive interesting structural transitions. For example, you can get things like ZDNA, cruciform formation. And for the sake of this talk, we'll be focusing on unwinding sites, which is when you have localized melting giving rise to these single stranded regions. And so, why do we care about this structure? Well, it turns out that various enzymes within the cell can use this unwinding as an initiation site to start their function. Here you can see a picture of RNA polymerase transcribing from the single stranded region. And interestingly, I'll note that it has been shown that RNA polymerase actually generates further supercoiling as it transcribes, which links the, trans which links the expression of neighboring genes. And so the hope is, is that we might be able to take advantage of the relationship between supercoiling and genetic function to design more dynamic vectors for delivering genetic information in the context of nanomedicines. Okay, so how do we actually study this phenomenon? Well, we can always start by using a kinetic model. And so what you can see here is a supercoiled plasmid opening and closing with a set of rates. And so by incorporating a labeled oligo, which is complementary to that unwinding site, it gives rise to the secondary reaction where the oligo binds and unbinds with another set of rates. This secondary reaction is our ticket to studying the strand and winding. And so to break it down, the probe will bind to this complementary site. We know that this complementary site is controlled by the supercoiling. And so if we can find a way to measure these bound complexes and use this binding model, we can learn about unwinding through the binding of the oligo. Before I can continue, I just must note that this is not the full picture. It's actually more complicated than this. There's these other structures I mentioned, which we're totally ignoring, and this will come up later. So just tuck that info in your back pocket. Okay, so now for the crucial tie-in. How do we actually use CLICK to identify these bound complexes? Well, we can use the diffusion equation that you see here to gain some insight. You'll note that the speed of the molecule is inversely proportional to the molecule size. In other words, this means that the big molecules diffuse slowly while small molecules diffuse quickly. Because the plasmid is much larger than the oligo, the oligo will slow down significantly once bound 
And by tuning the exposure time of our camera, we can ensure that the fast moving oligos are blurry while the slow moving complexes are crisp and localized. So here to demonstrate this, I've shown a, a movie of an array of click microwells containing plasmids and oligos. And if we zoom in on some representative wells, you'll notice that these blurry images correspond to free oligos, while these localized crisp images correspond to bound oligos. And by counting the number of these bound complexes, we can effectively measure how unwinding changes under a number of conditions. And so in the past, our group has used this method to determine the effect of a number of parameters on strand unwinding. For instance, a very basic question someone might ask is how does temperature influence this unwinding? Well, as you can probably guess, increasing the temperature will also increase the amount of unwinding. If this doesn't make sense to you, we can explain it a little more by noting that increasing the temperature will bring the plasmid closer to its natural melting temperature, which gives you more bang for your buck in terms of that torsional energy that the supercoiling is putting into the system. What's less clear, however, is how the plasmid will actually relax back to an equilibrium value once it's been temperature shocked away from equilibrium. And the reason this is interesting is because the temperature shock can act as a kind of thermodynamic model for a whole host of other non-equilibrium phenomena characteristic of biological processes. And so to do this, to investigate this non-equilibrium phenomenon, we'll look at two different extremes. We'll take a plasmid right out of the fridge, incubated at 37 for a little while, which you see here in this incubation timeline. And after an incubation time T, we'll reincorporate this oligo, and then finally we'll count the bound molecules using click. So as you can see for the molecules out of the fridge, the binding doesn't change significantly uh, over the course of 144 hours. And this tells us that the molecules reach equilibrium quite quickly um, coming out of the fridge. Next, we looked at preheated plasmids. And the only difference here with this incubation timeline is that first we bring the plasmids up to 95 degrees Celsius and then slowly cool back to 37. And then after a time T, we again incorporate the probe and measure the bound complexes using click. And so as expected, this first curve that you see after zero hours corresponds to a vast increase in the amount of unwound plasmids. And so this is expected because of our previous results. What's more surprising, however, is the fact that this increase took a, an extremely long time to relax back to an equilibrium. In this particular case, it took a whole six days for the plasma to react, to relax rather. So what gives? The strands are right next to one another the whole time, and you might expect this process to be fast. Remember, however, that the kinetic model that we've used to describe this process is vastly oversimplified. Namely, there's all these other secondary structures which we're completely ignoring. And so this result suggests that competition between the unwinding site and these other structures for that limited torsional energy might be driving these long timescales. And so what other evidence do we have to support this hypothesis? Well, to actually measure the secondary structures other than the unwinding site, we cooled and heated plasmid, plasmids and used a potassium permanganate footprinting gel, which basically just means that we cut single-stranded regions and then run this in an electrophoretic gel. So what you can see here is a cartoon of the linearized plasmid showing a cruciform and fused unwinding site. And if we break this up according to the strands that can appear on the gel, we'll have one strand corresponding to nothing, no unwinding or cruciform, one corresponding to the unwinding, and then these three strands corresponding to both unwinding and a cruciform being present. And so here's the actual gels with the one at 37 on the left and the preheated gel on the right. And what I'll draw your attention to is the intensities of these three bands change, indicating that the relative proportions of these structures also changes upon preheating. Furthermore, if we look at uh, some equilibrium statistical mechanics modeling this situation, you can see that at a given temperature, ZDNA and denaturation occur with sort of similar proportions. But then at a slightly different temperature, you can see that the proportion of denaturated DNA vastly dominates the ZDNA. However, what's missing from these pictures is the time scales involved. And we believe our results that I showed previously with the binding uh, suggest that there's a competition which is giving rise to the long time scales we've seen, competition between these secondary structures. And so before I conclude, I'd just like to give some acknowledges to my group and the funding sources. 
um, partic in particular, a special shout out to Cindy Shaheen, who actually leads this work. Um, and I wouldn't be able to do this presentation without her help. So thanks so much, Cindy. Just to summarize, Click is a very useful and versatile technique that can be used to solve many single molecule problems from delivery all the way to binding. Second, supercoiled plasma DNA gives, rich, gives rise to many dynamics worth studying in the context of genetic medicine. And finally, non-equilibrium processes are really interesting and relevant to almost every aspect of biology, but despite this, they're critically understudied. Thanks very much for listening to my talk. I'd love to take any questions if you have them. So Cameron, um, could you speak to how the signal to noise ratio is determined in this assay? Thanks for the great question, Leah. Um, so in this assay, the signal to noise ratio is sort of the most limiting aspect of the entire assay. We're using single fluorophores here. And so that means that we're kind of starved for signal and we have to pay close attention to our noise. Um, something that really limits this assay in terms of the concentrations we can use is actually those blurry oligos that you'll see in the pits. We don't actually measure those or care about them at all. All we really want to do is count the bound oligos. But having more of those blurry free oligos in the pits actually limits our ability to do this. And so it would be great if we could operate at higher concentrations. And we're working on solutions to this with uh, things like molecular beacons, which are hairpin oligos that aren't fluorescent unless they're bound. And so we don't have those free oligos anymore. And just to give a little teaser to next month, there's another member of our group, uh, an undergrad named Rebecca Johnson, who will be presenting on this molecular beacon work, a little preview of where we've gotten so far. Thanks for the question, Leah. Great, thank you. And actually, I'd like to ask another question. I'm curious about uh, the plasmids that you use in, in the research. Can you provide us more detail on those? Yeah, so um, I'm coming from a physics background, so uh, if I don't have the right details, anybody who's listening can just send me an email and I'll definitely send them some more details. But um, yeah, we have a synthetic plasmid, which actually uh, has an insert of this fuse uh, unwinding site. It's relevant in the context of these semic oncogenes. Uh, the fuse region actually regulates those genes through supercoiling and those, those genes uh, give rise to a whole bunch of cancers. And so this fuse region, by studying how it changes with supercoiling, we actually gain some insight into how that oncogene is regulated. 